All right. Hi, everyone. I'm Stephen Downs, the purveyor of bad videos and recordings. Uh, it is recording video right now, and I'm off the frame. <laughs> um, so if you have any comments later on, by all means, uh, please be aware that you're being recorded. And the internet will use what you say against you in some way, shape, or form. This is the internet. So I work for the National Research Council of Canada. It's Canada's national research agency. They somehow gave me a job. And uh, I've been with them since 2001. So I somehow kept that job. I specialize in the area of online learning, new instructional media. I've been involved in things like massive open online courses, open educational resources, personal learning environments, and I have my uh, daily newsletter called OLJ. Uh, you can scan the QR code on the slide. That will take you to my presentation page where you can download uh, these slides or a PDF version of the slides, as well as link to the paper that the talk is based on as well as, after the talk, the audio recording, which is being trans, or not trans, well, transcribed. So the actual transcription of this talk, plus oops, some bad video, uh, which I, hope, I was hoping to stream it live, but at the last minute it said, you have to set up your live streaming. And it's the first time it's done that in several years. So it's working with tech. This talk is titled Three Frameworks for Data Literacy. All right, I have the clicker. I had the opportunity to practice with the clicker earlier, but I declined it. Now I regret that decision. So data literacy is, and I'm just pulling a definition out of the air here. Uh, we'll discard it in a little bit. But basically, the ability to collect, manage, evaluate, and apply data all in a critical manner. And it includes various skills to discover, access data, to evaluate data quality, to interpret the results of the analysis, and so on. It's a relatively new field. Started more or less around 2010, sort of went away and then came back over the last few years with a vengeance. And we can pretty much imagine why it came back in the last few years with a vengeance. And it's kind of interesting to me because it covers the different topics that we've talked about today, going everywhere from analyzing the content validity of, say, surveys, to looking at different ways of teaching people skills like conferencing to even thinking about creating artworks. And so all of these will be captured in some way in this talk. I'll try to feed them in as we go through. So what I do in this talk is I present data literacy in terms of three frameworks. The first framework consists of what is data literacy itself? What is it actually trying to do? Boy, that's really small. Sorry, I have a very short attention span. I don't know how to make it bigger because the plus sign was gone. I can't see it. <laughs> oh, <wow. laughs> Turn around. Yeah. Um, it's, you know, it's talking about teaching people how to go to conferences how to do conferences. The first thing they teach you is don't be like that guy <laughs> who stands there and gives his talk like this. <laughs> right? Isn't that true? And that's why they have a presentation view. Yeah. But literally, this here's my slide that I'm showing here. It is this big. 
My eyes are 64 years old. They <laughs> don't work like that anymore. Again, keyboardology, I think that's required, should be a required yeah, course. <laughs> so, anyhow, um, so I'm failing the competency model, obviously. Oh, sorry. <laughs> oh, not this one. Sorry, sorry, I just got uh, That's okay. It's uh, getting a sneak preview here. Oh. Yeah, the notes section is huge, right? <laughs> but of course, I have no notes. And even if I did, I wouldn't be able to read that. Now good? Better? Oh, that's way better. Thank you. Mm -hmm. I can actually read it. Good. <laughs> All right. Yeah. yeah. Don't get 64-year-old eyes unless you absolutely have to. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but you will absolutely have to, I hope. All right. So, three frameworks. First of all, talking about the competency models that define data literacy. Second, the assessment of these competencies. And third, methods for the development of these competencies in an organization. Now, very high level presentation because we had, what, eight pages to produce our results. So, unfortunately, we skip over a bunch of things in this presentation, although I wrote do some follow-up papers looking into some of the details, and I'll flag those when I get them. All right. Literacy. Again, we could do volumes, books on what literacy is. Um, but I think we can say that learning a literacy is more than just learning the components of a literacy. It's like learning a language is more than just learning the words, right? It's when to use them, how to use them, what the idioms are, etc. And there's an element of being literate that comes out of uh, that learning, right? Uh, literate, literacy isn't just knowledge that you have, it's something that you become as a result of that knowledge. What is then that you become? Well, you embody, shall we say, a set of skills or competencies typically thought to define the literacy in question. Um, these are reflected in the assessment of that literacy, and in turn, the teaching of that literacy is based on that assessment. The actual study of data literacy, again, it's a new field, is pretty limited. It was even more limited when I started working on this project. A few years have gone by, and there is a lot more stuff that's come out from last year, which isn't really reflected in this paper. So, the reviewer said, I need to say more about my methodology. I'm not one of those people who does the Hey, you know, uh, how did that go? <laughs> uh, research question, hypothesis. Yeah, even, even the peer review thing, anyhow. Um, but I did try to be as methodological as I could because this study was being done for the assistant deputy minister uh, of an information branch for the Department of National Defense in Canada. So they did kind of want a method. So we did a formal literature review in conjunction with the National Science Library contents and NRC's own information management service. We also did a wider review using the same parameters for Google Scholar. Neither of those were really comprehensive. I find, especially in rapidly moving topics, that a lot of the best and newest material can be found in what they call gray literature, uh, preprints, blog posts, social media, etc. And I did depend a lot, a lot on that to find sources. If I had simply depended on the official published sources, I would not have had nearly the material to conduct this review. And that's something, that's why I asked that question. Not, I'm looking at you, but you're not only gave that talk. <laughs> Um, so anyhow, found about 150 results. In those 150 results, I found 20 papers that could reasonably be said to define a theory of data literacy. I found three major evaluation frameworks that I looked at. There were other evaluation frameworks based on those three major frameworks. 
So it was, you know, maybe six or seven altogether, but really three core ones. And then a number of highly specific data literacy development models. Since then, you told me about your course. I also found some uh, materials on uh, working with data from Carleton, um, Carleton College. I mistook it for Carleton University, and I just saw that the other day. There's been a bunch of new stuff come out recently. Um, but it's all highly specific. It's all very local to a particular environment in a particular course. So these are the themes that emerged. Virtually everyone depicted data literacy as a set of skills and competencies, which isn't really that surprising given the talk uh, or you know, the literature around literacy generally. Um, a lot of them talked about the idea of deriving information or meaningful information from data. Uh, there was a lot of talk about the data lifestyle or the data workflow. Um, there was the complexity of skills for different roles. And what I found interesting, data literacy can be defined both on an individual and they use corporate, but I think organizational more generally can be thought of as an organizational or a group capacity. And that's not really usually how we think of literacy, is it? Usually we think of literacy as an individual set of competencies. Um, but in this case, literacy was depicted as and evaluated as a corporate or an organizational competency. So let's look at the competency model. So competencies, set of basic knowledge and skills or other characteristics that enable people to work efficiently, etc. Um, we draw a um, well-established concept that includes knowledge, skills, abilities, and other characteristics. And the, the concept of competency also includes uh, importantly, some way of measuring for it or evaluating for it. So it's a two-part thing, right? Here's, here's what you know, and here's how we know that you know what you know. Except it's not just what you know, it's what you can do. Um, it's how, it's what your attitude are, it's, it's well, etc. as we will see. Here's the analysis. I'm, your slides are a little bit out of sync from your one behind. Oh, oh, okay, I get you. Yeah, yeah. Oh, how silly is that? <laughs> We're following that. Right. I'm really sorry about this slide. It's in the paper. Um, but those are the 20 studies across the top. And these are the competencies. Now, what, what I did in the study is I kind of had to wordsmith a bit because among these 20 papers, nobody used the same set of definitions, terms, etc. We have 20 completely distinct depictions of not only data literacy generally, but these competencies in, in particular. So there is a fuzziness there, which is why fuzzy content validity is a good idea. Um, I'll read them quickly for you just for the fun of it. Awareness, dispositions, strategy or culture, uh, plan, inquiry, discovery, ethics, gathering, curation, communities, requirements, evaluation, evaluation, assessment, informed decision, governance, standards, description or metadata, conversion or interoperability, management, preservation, cleaning. Systems and tools, policy, quality, security, manipulation, statistics and reasoning, critical thinking, analysis, interpretation, sorry, I had to pause for breath there, <laughs> modeling, architecture, data science and machine learning, visualization, storytelling, presenting data verbally, which is what I'm doing now, <laughs> change, using or presenting with, identifying problems, and data generation. 
each of these all each of these breaks down into subcategories like data generation, uh, creative, automatic, etc. You can see why they contacted us asking for an analysis of data literacy because every paper they read on the subject said something different. Defined it differently. As you can, where's the, you know, <laughs> Where's the pattern here? <laughs> right? Um, you know, the more we analyze it, the less we see a pattern. Um, and that's, that's the state of the literature, and that's why I'm doing this paper. So, yeah. First step, I kind of broke it down into five major models. I, I borrowed from uh, I also borrowed from uh, Shield to, to name some of these, but nobody names all five. That's unique to this paper. These are rough categorizations, just as a Kubrick. Kubrick? 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 No. Whatever. There's a word there that isn't rubric, but I can't. I don't don't present when you're old. Uh, <laughs> all right. So here are the five models. First of all, data stewardship model. It, it talks about the idea of literacy from the context of being a steward of data. Supporting analytics and decision making. Um, you know, this, this includes the collection of, of, of approaches by, from the data literacy project. Uh, which is something that came out of Dalhousie in Nova Scotia. Um, it's the idea of keeping data as a data custodian, if you will. And that's a type of literacy. Of course, it's a type of literacy. The information literacy model, this is very common and widely used. I saw it in a bunch of studies. And it, it borrows heavily from information literacy, even digital literacy a bit. Um, a problem, of course, is that the domain of information literacy is even more fragmented than the domain of data literacy. So it doesn't help a lot. But, you know, it's about getting information from, da from data, theories of information, information management principles, uh, knowledge and the flow of information, to borrow a title from Fred Gretzky, and, and related topics. There's one that may be more familiar to this group, science and research data literacy model. And it does include things like validity, uh, different forms of validity. Uh, it emphasizes aspects of data related to computer science, mathematics, statistics, um, forms of statistical representation, the ability to analyze, interpret, and evaluate statistical information. Uh, you see it represented for example, um, in the Alberta Bureau of Statistics, among others. I only saw it in a single source, but it was a singular model, so it became number five, the social engagement model. This is thinking of data literacy from the perspective of social interaction and especially online social interaction. It kind of includes things like data journalism. Um, it kind of includes things like uh, seeing patterns in social media, like Twitter. Um, I refuse to use the other name. Not that I use it anymore, anyways. You should be using Mastodon. Stuff like that. So, also, the major a major theme that evolves and is discussed in the literature is the idea of a data workflow. In uh, another bit of work that I did on ethics and analytics, we'll see a wee bit about that in a little bit, um, there's a whole machine learning and artificial intelligence workflow. And part of that is this data workflow. It, it includes everything from the framing of the problem or context of use 
the data set itself, defining it, getting it, cleaning it, and so on, the application of the model to some new situation, and then testing, evaluation, presentation, etc. There's kind of a common workflow. Um, I wouldn't say it's strictly formalized. Notice that it's different from the workflow that's not presented a bit earlier uh, about uh, presenting the scientific paper. And then finally, the individual and group competencies. This is something people have a lot of trouble wrapping their heads around because they hadn't drawn that distinction before, even though a number of commercial companies were presenting studies, they were selling studies to companies saying, evaluate your corporate data literacy, data literacy skills. And the people who were receiving this were getting things like, uh, evaluate your individual data literacy skills, and they were blending the two together as though they're the same thing. But of course they're not. How does, you know, when you think about how does it differ? Well, with an individual, for, for example, they might have knowledge of how to use databases, how to use uh, Excel, maybe how to use cloud storage to hold your data. On the corporate or organizational side, there would be things like data management principles, staffing and resources for managing a data pool or data lake, um, you know, a corporate data retention policy, adherence to GDPR, stuff like that. Same skill but different from an individual to a corporation. So, we have a mess, frankly. Uh, and how do we even assess that mess? This is where the model comes in. Why would I get a phone call during the talk? <laughs> I'd like to say that's the first time that's ever happened to me. <laughs> All right. I'm still behind. Yeah. This is so much fun. The slide that I can read really well is not the slide that's up there. I've been having fun with this the whole time. Okay, so. And it, it was a... This is this is one of this is an example of uh, accurate but, but not relevant. <laughs> we got the accuracy. We, I now can read this slide. It's a long slide. <laughs> All right. So my proposal is this: single factor measurements of data literacy will not measure data literacy. Uh, they're, they're completely insufficient to account for the variability in the set of data literacy competencies and the varying degree to which each competency is required in different jobs. I haven't shown the second part. That would need to be shown, but I, I hope I've shown the first part. Mm -hmm. The second part really kind of comes out as we go along. Accordingly, a role-defined data literacy model is proposed. And this model basically illustrates the calculation of data literacy in this way. So, how did we come to this idea? Well, first of all, we looked at what was out there for data literacy assessments. Uh, the three big assessments, the OECD, program for international assessment of adult competencies has a specific data literacy section. There's also, uh, endorsed by the American Statistical Association, the guidelines for assessment and instruction in statistics education, kind of narrowly focused on just one of the models, but still a very influential and widely used model. Uh, Eckerson Group, and in particular David Wells, has an excellent analysis of data literacy in general and the assessment of data literacy in particular. Looked at more, um, but these were the big ones. The databilities one, for example, was drawn mostly from OECD, and there were others that we looked at. So, 
thinking of the assessment modeling, most of these assessed it for a list of competencies. But as you saw, we have this completely unstructured list of competencies. No consistency at all. So time to create a model, and unfortunately, this is all you're going to see of it, based on a modified version of Bloom's taxonomy. Why Bloom? Because everyone knows Bloom. Everybody understands Bloom. It's just a taxonomy, not the way the world is. So it's fine, right? Only we, we modified it in a couple of ways. Uh, we use the three, most people, mostly when people look at Bloom's taxonomy, they look at the cognitive set. There are, of course, three sets, cognitive, psychomotor, and affective. Um, and then these are the, for the individual values, we can talk about knowledge, skills or competencies, and attitudes. Now, I know I'm talking about skills and competencies big in general, and we have skills and competencies here. That's what happens when nobody uses terminology consistently. We have skills and competencies containing a subdivision called skills and competencies. I'm sorry. And then on the organizational side, instead of the knowledge, it's organizationally defined, right? Instead of skills or competencies, we have capacities. Instead of the affective domain being attitudes, we have practices. Pulled it out of the air, I admit, but pulled out of the air based on what those surveys were actually measuring for when they did, you know, that our organization has a standardized practice for data retention. That's one of the questions, right? And then it's on a Likert scale. Presumably assessed for content validity, although maybe not with the fuzzy Delphi model. Um, so, kind of pulled out of the air, but not randomly pulled out of the air. Just as an aside, talking about patterns earlier, finding patterns isn't a matter of analysis and synthesis. Uh, not to my mind, anyway. Patterns, finding patterns is a case of recognition. It's a gestalt thing. You look at it, you see the pattern, and then you rationalize it later by going through a process of analysis and synthesis. But the actual finding of the pattern is just a recognition thing based on prior experience. We can talk about that in length, but I won't. All right. I didn't want to ask that as a question, but I thought about it. Oh, he's going to fix it. Yeah. Oh, you're wonderful. Thank you. Better, Phil? That's awesome. Cool. Now I don't have to be like a first-year conference presenter. Could be worse. I was doing a talk for the National Research Council, um, and it's Canada, so it's bilingual, so I'm expected to translate it as I go, do the English, then do the French. No problem. I'm not great in French, but I'm not bad. So I thought, okay, I'll put all of my slides in French on the monitor, and then the two languages here, so I'll be able to see the French in front of me. Well, the way they set it up was on a stage, and there was a little computer way down there. Oh, that was my monitor. And there's no way. <laughs> Always investigate the setup first. Okay. So, and now in follow up papers, not in this paper, unfortunately, there's a very detailed breakdown of all the competences within this table. But this, this is how it came out, okay? Um, over here, we have our competencies. And then here, we looked at the different descriptions for all the different jobs or roles in the Canadian Armed Forces. There's a lot of them. And the idea is that we tested these job descriptions for, I don't want to say simple word count because that's inaccurate, but for the relevance of the data. Now, let me be clear. We did not actually do that testing. 
So I can't report to you, here is the statistically validated thing against all of these job descriptions. It was, we presented the conceptual model only. And with the proposal that they should test it. Got to be clear about that. I don't want to pretend I got results that I didn't get, no, that I didn't actually get. Intellectual honesty, or I didn't do the work. Okay. But here's not what should, but what would come out of such an analysis is one of these spider web charts. We have all of the competencies around the outside, and then what I call a competency profile. And basically, it's the degree to which each job, or job description more accurately, reflects a need for an individual competency. Because when you get down to it, Data literacy amounts to something different for every single job that you know. Yeah, there are similarities. Yeah, there's an overlap. Yeah, the concept of data literacy is a family resemblance kind of thing. But family resemblance means that there is not something that they all and only they have. If there's an overlap. We recognize it if we see it, but there's no way we can ever analyze it to get it out of what we're seeing. Hope that makes sense. The same process, virtually exactly the same process we suggested, but again did not test, can be used to create actual competency profiles for each individual. You can imagine how much the military loved this. But what's not to love, right? Take a look at, say, their test results, or even better, since the military watches everything, actual communications generated by the person in question, subject to ethics and privacy regulations. Of course. As an aside, this is how we will do assessment generally in the future, not just of data literacy, but everything. Why would we do the whole formalized exam kind of thing anymore. When we have computers that can look at the sum total of everything you produce and produce a competency profile. And where that competency profile can be map, mapped to a role profile. Where the role profile can, in the first instance, be derived from the job descriptions but in the second instance, also not conducted, but recommended through the examination of the actual practices undertaken by people who are already experts in whatever domain we're talking about. Think about it. We look at what they're doing. We create the profile. That profile defines the role. We take an individual, look at what they're doing. That profile defines their role. We compare them we can see whether a person is suited to the role. So, given all that, how do we go about developing data literacy in an organization? This was the least studied thing that we saw. Um, there were a few specific proposals. There were a few models, um, but nothing like, you know, uh, discipline-wide consensus of any sort. Um, so, data literacy basically seems to fall within two extremes. And this is an important point, I think. I think. On the one hand, and you saw this in the models, it, it's you know one of the many information and communications competencies. It's part of this much larger program um, you know, maybe journalism, maybe information science, uh, etc. Or, on the other hand, for people who are more into science, technology, engineering, math, it's the first step in the development of higher level competencies such as data engineering, data architect, information management, etc. 
very technical kind of decision. Either way, we're envisioning data literacy as one part of something very large, very complex, and when we're teaching data literacy, we have to be teaching it in terms of what they're going to be doing with it later. So there's no such thing, on this view, as a simple data literacy program. That's probably not true. I don't think it's true. Um, I think we can think of data literacy kind of apart from that context, provided we think of it as this role-based sort of thing. I know that sounded a lot like saying we can think of it outside that context as long as we think of it inside that context, which sounds ridiculous. But essentially that's what I'm saying. We think of it not so much as content or knowledge to be used. So not in that context of a wider discipline, but rather as a part of other processes and strategies employed to achieve real objectives or outcomes within that context. So it's not nonsense, it only sounds like nonsense. So looked at a bunch of data literacy roadmaps to see how other people were approaching the subject. Did a information literacy project, was one quant hub, found a series of foundational steps. Dave Wells, which I already mentioned from Eckerson, excellent program. And then Gartner has a, a three-phase methodology. They all did it that way, not thinking of it as part of this overall program, but thinking of data literacy more in isolation, thinking of it, thinking of it as a process or a method. Some more initiatives get a literacy project. No longer exists, uh, but they did very good work. Um, and then there's the Educause Data Literacy Institute, which really is just getting going. Found so a bunch of what could be called teaching and learning methods. And it's very similar to, I, I would put the, uh, the uh, simulated scientific conference right in the middle of this list. Um, because I think that's where, probably where it would be most appropriate. The data storming, simulations, case-based, using real-world data, data decision-making, etc. Stephen, could you uh, wrap up? I think we probably will have some questions for you. But yeah, you, you wouldn't believe how close I am to my last summer. Okay. <laughs> so, I developed a data, data literacy MOOC, which was a failure. Nobody joined. <laughs> I also developed a MOOC in Ethics, Analytics, and the Duty of Care, um, which was much more successful, but I used the same principles. And the idea was give people data, have them work with the data, have them draw their own connections and their own inferences. And so in the subject of ethics, analytics, and the duty of care, we have all of these domains. We have relations. Those lines are for representative purposes only. They're not actual links. But there is a graph of actual links in the course. Um, and so they're actually working with and producing uh, models and interpretations of the data. It was, it was a very useful exercise. I learned a ton and got a great publication out of it. Um, student activities in this environment, classifying, identifying, identifying relations, identifying uh, data subjects, assessing the resulting data model, looking at the threads. If you follow the lines from thing to thing to thing, you have a story or a paper or whatever. Participation encouraged both individual and organizational data competencies. At least I think, again, I did not evaluate them for did they actually achieve these competencies. Because I don't like giving students tests. Uh, but I did find it where it requires working with others in order to develop not only the individual capacities and skills, but also social capacities and skills. So, last slide, almost. <laughs> Sorry. Uh, 
There's no single definition of data literacy, but it's not yet taught now, which is kind of weird. Uh, so we recommend developing and piloting non-hierarchical cooperative learning communities, such as a MOOC, in order to foster data literacy. But keep in mind, all of this is conceptual, except for the actual course, which was built and delivered. Uh, this hasn't been tested. It's a framework to be used in future tests. Epilogue. This is a Picasso. It is now my Picasso. Um, and I'm going to take it and I'm going to print it and I'm going to hang it on my wall and I'll have a Picasso. But it's actually in the Fu Chao City Hall. And the important point here is that data isn't just rows and columns of text. Data is everything. It's all that stuff. And the thing is, I do a lot of photography. You saw a few examples of it in the slides. Uh, some manipulation of that photography. And I look at that, and as much as I love it, I see all the reasons why it's not the original. Like this, I couldn't get rid of it. You see the shadowing. Yeah. So I just made it part of the picture because, yeah, you can. So, it's by working with the stuff that you become literate in it. There really is no other way. And ultimately, that's what fostering data literacy means. Working with the data, gathering it, manipulating it, using it to create something, whether it's a scientific paper, whether it's a Picasso, or anything in between. And like I said, it draws all of these things together. That's the smell of that. I'm so sorry. No. Thank you. Time for a few quick questions. If you need to leave, that's uh, fine. We're almost to, to the end of the session. But if you have any questions for Stephen? So I missed the very first two slides. Sorry, we went another session and had to wait until it was time to come over. But are you starting with people that are going to work with data in your jobs, or is it more broad? It was more broad. It's more broad. Yeah, yeah. We, we, you know, we were interested in everybody in, in the organization, uh, including, and, and they stress this, including frontline soldiers who need to know whether they're being fed misinformation or not. Yeah, so we, we have a project that we've looked at for citizens in general, just mm -hmm. gen general people. We start a little bit more basic, exactly what is data, um, more sort of awareness that there's data and data being collected around us and going up with that. Because part of the part of what we found was like in, in the businesses as well, people who encounter data in their everyday job, they may not be working with the data, but they should be a critical thinker. Mm -hmm. So if something that comes across the desk asking for data or asking if they could read something, they need to be able to hold on it. So I think I agree with you 100 percent Lots of these models are on many different things, many different we try to exclude ones that we think people do work with data in our study. So I'll share with you our our papers. Yeah, and thank our you. Thank you for a very interesting talk. I especially liked um, your idea about looking at data literacy, not just as an individual and organizational level, but actually at a role level. And this idea that you brought up about assessments, um, how it's possible to analyze pretty much every single communication and interaction of a person and compare that to the data literacy requirements for a certain role. Um, first thing that came to my mind, gestalt pattern recognition, recurrent neural networks are very good yeah. at doing this type of pattern recognition, not just all of your communications, but all of your interactions online. And there are countries that now score people based on all of their interactions online to determine who might be best um, suited maybe for a certain study program at a yeah. university. Uh, scary for me as a computer scientist. Most, you know, I have no evidence of this, but I would put very large amounts of money on the proposition that companies are already doing this with social media. I'm virtually certain that this is the case. And LinkedIn 
Resurgence, is, for example. Re, yeah, is specifically designed for that purpose. Mm -hmm. So, so I just want to confirm, like, was different meaning for the same thing? That's a good question. No, 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 no. I, I just you're right. Think you're, when I say that's a good question, I mean, that's a really good question, right? Is there a same thing that constitutes data literacy that they have different meanings for? Or are each of them using a different meaning for a different thing that we're sort of loosely categorizing? And I believe the second is the case, right? So each, each of the 20 papers looks at data literacy, frames it like this, and then looks at it. But they each do it a bit differently, and they're looking at different things. <laughs> but they're overlapping in a family resemblance, and we, because we're humans, with neural networks, we go, oh yeah, that's all the same thing. It's like Wittgenstein in games, right? What is a game? And again, you have a gazillion definitions of game, but each definition looks at some things. Chess, not a game. Chess, a game. No, chess is a sport. No, anyhow. Time and space messing with her again, right? Yep. And like, the, the calling codes in the last table, what do you mean by codes? In the in the in the in the D mock. Yeah, D mock, yeah. Here? That was the codes. Sorry. Oh, no, 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 you just pressed through. Yeah. Yeah, domains, principles. Okay. Oh, oh, I'm sorry. Yeah, uh, um, that refers to ethical codes. Um, ah, nice. Yeah. So it's part of another paper. Um, I did a study of 70 different um, ethical codes and practices for artificial intelligence, data ethics, legal ethics, journalistic ethics, and so on, um, to examine the claim made by, who made it, Feld? Someone. Um, I think it was Feld, saying, oh no, we have a common set of ethical principles that we all adhere to. And that's what should define ethics for artificial intelligence. So I examined all of these codes. I got a pretty similar result to what I got here. <laughs> There's no single principle, even leaving aside the definitions of the principles, there is no single principle adopted by every code. That's good, that's good, that's good. That's They're good. not even close, <laughs> right? And you know, look, right off the bat, look at the major principles, right? Virtue ethics, duty ethics, benefit or uh, consequentialism, contract ethics, and meta ethics, or my old professor used to say meta ethics. <laughs> you never get out of my head. And, and on, right? So, yeah. Um, so, yeah. So, the, this, this diagram, interestingly, works from the outside in. And that's how my paper is designed as well, kind of. But on the one hand, from all the different applications, again, I did a list, big long list. I do lists. And then working in from the center. And then from the different codes, analyzing what the ethical implications were, running them through a filter of duty of care ethics. And then in the center, and this is the last chapter of the paper, uh, ethical practices for uh, artificial intelligence. Thank you. I think we're going to have to end the session uh, now, but because we're a little bit over time. But please continue your discussions after the sessions with our speakers. I want to thank all the speakers. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Here's your certificate. I was watching. I don't know how much of the time I spent in the frame of my video. You were sort of at the. Yeah.